welcome you all very warmly on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, it seems a world away from the topic of today's lecture, but we're very pleased to welcome Christopher Hood, um, who's reader in Japanese studies at Cardiff University, as well as being president of the British Association for Japanese Studies. As I'm sure you all know, because you're here, Chris's research interests primarily relate to Japan in two areas, the themes relating to memorialization, identity and its symbolism, and issues relating to railways and aviation in Japan. Chris is the author of many books on these subjects, including Shinkansen, From Bullet Train to Symbol of Modern Japan, which was published by Routledge in 2006, and perhaps linked in more ways to today's theme, again published by Routledge in 2011, um, dealing with disaster in Japan responses to the flight JL123 crash. He's continued to research the crash and its memorialization from many different perspectives. And uh, most recently, as we shall hear today, looking at narrative in disaster movies. Chris, I'll hand straight over to you. Welcome to the Japan Society. Thank you very much, Heidi. Let me start by trying to make sure that I'm sharing my screens. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, thank you very much um, for coming today. The timing of this was very much um, designed to ensure that those who are in Japan, who are, uh, I thought might be wanting to see this, would be able to um, tune in. In the, in the end, um, I don't think any of us could predict that the weather would be quite so good. Even in Cardiff, apparently, outside my house, it's bright and sunny at the moment. Um, and sorry to those of you who were hoping to make the most of lockdown regulations being easy and go to the pub um, if you've decided to come to, long, to this instead. Um, the title, as you know, is uh, Japan Disaster Narratives, Conservatism and Revisionism. In relating to this talk, I think I should point out that um, obviously I will be talking about some traumatic events, and I will be, assuming that the internet can cope with it, be showing a variety of media files. Um, there's no sound with these media files, but they are video clips um, largely taken from particular movies, um, often using clips already up on YouTube. Um, so obviously, if these sort of things are likely to impact you, please take appropriate precautions. So, um, disaster movies have a long history. As Kay and Rose note, ever since some of the first silent films were produced, catastrophe and spectacle have been important parts of the movies. Some studies of disaster narratives have been on discussions about trying to understand the appeal of such movies. Others have looked to understand the movies within the wider social context, and others have looked in detail at specific disaster narratives, um, particularly ones about the Titanic. Whilst disaster narratives are primarily to entertain, they can even lead to people changing their perceptions of risk and how to respond to disaster. Movies also have an impact upon how people understand past events, though Tipton points out that enthusiasts of history communicate a sense of frustration and disgust when assessing Hollywood's treatment of the past. Sorry, my uh, click is not working at the moment, so I'm gonna to have to do it manually. There we go. Building upon the idea by Miletti that disasters themselves are designed by a range of cultural and social influences, I have done an extensive analysis of English language and Japanese language disaster narratives to consider what conventions may be found within such narratives. I found that there are some significant similarities and also differences. This will be the focus of today's presentation. The study is significant as it highlights issues relating to the differences in how Japanese disaster narratives are constructed. Being aware of this is important for those involved in the movie industry, for example, when considering the likely appeal of narratives in different cultures, societies, or countries. Furthermore, the, art, the presentation points out that while there are many similarities and differences across language or geographic areas, there are also areas where there are changes within Japan too. By highlighting these areas of conservatism and revisionism, it becomes possible to plan how to construct future disaster narratives. Keane notes that in contrast to classic genre like the Western and popular contemporary genre like horror and science fiction, disaster movies have remained relatively neglected within the film studies. However, as Yakawa argues, 
disaster films constitute a sufficiently numerous old and conventionalized group to be considered a genre rather than a popular cycle that comes and goes. Yet the database IMDB does not include a disaster genre. Consequently, one must question what constitutes a disaster narrative. The problem with defining a disaster narrative has its roots in the lack of a de definition of a disaster itself. While some studies seek to define what a disaster is or how they should be researched, Levinson and Grano point out that there is no clear and universally accepted definition of when an accident becomes a disaster. Fundamentally, a disaster stems from a society's inability to respond to or be prepared for a natural or human-made event. In other words, the common distinction between natural or man-made disasters is largely unhelpful and misplaced. Almost all disasters are man-made regardless of what one of the triggers may have been, keeping in mind that no accident or disaster will have had a single trigger, with the disaster being caused by the coming together of a series of factors, policies, and behaviors that meant that the situation was not properly prepared for or responded to. Whilst Mitchell et al. suggests that a disaster narrative is one where the key was whether the hazard might be described as the star of the film, this definition is slightly different to that of Quarantelli, who considered films with substantial scenes or footage of disaster happenings. Using a revision to Mitchell et al.'s definition, I consider narratives where there would have been no story if it was not for the disaster. On top of this, I do not consider certain types of narratives as part of the disaster genre. These include satire movies, animated narratives, clear-cut science fiction, which is taken to mean those that involve attacks from extraterrestrials or fictional monsters, and horror and supernatural movies. In total, my study had 38 English language disaster narratives, although 88, 82 were initially viewed, but many were ultimately not included for one reason or another, with one of the most common reasons being that the disaster did not actually happen in the end. This was particularly noticeable when it came to those narratives revolving around aircraft. While 48 such narratives were initially studied, 37 were not included in the results. The primary reason was that in many cases, the plane did not crash, so there was no disaster. And in some other cases, the plane crash was not large enough to be considered a disaster. While there appears to be no agreed basis upon which a plane crash is considered a disaster, which, as discussed above, is not unrelated to the problem of defining any disaster, research about the dynamics and biases of online attention in plane crashes by Garcia, Gavilnes, Svetkova, and Yasseri presents a useful basis. Their research indicates that when there are more than 40 deaths, there is much greater interest in the crash on the internet. On this basis, known plane crash narratives were included if there were less than 14 fatalities. This is not to say that no plane crash with less than this figure could be considered a disaster. One involving a monarch, president, prime minister, or a football team, for example, the plane crash involving Manchester United football team in 1958 is usually referred to as the Munich air disaster, for example, may be reasonably considered within such a context. Indeed, such cases would show as much as the event itself, it is the symbolism and other repercussions of the event that would make it a disaster. Therefore, some disasters are disasters due to their broader symbolic or international impact rather than due to the direct impact upon people. As noted earlier, IMDB does not have a disaster genre, and so all the movies that were considered were classified as being between one and three other genre on IMDB. It should also be noted that of the movies studied, most do not have a very high rating on IMDb, although there are some notable exceptions. The first aim of my research was to update a study done by Yakua. Yakua had identified 16 conventions that appear in disaster movies, as well as categorizing disaster movies into types. However, even though many other works have cited Yakua's studies over the years, and the book in which it appears has had several editions, the chapter by Yakua itself has not been updated since it was originally written in 1976. In other words, it was written before the disaster blockbusters of the 1990s, such as James, Cameron, James Cameron's Titanic, 
which is the highest grossing historical disaster movie of all time and is still the third highest grossing film of all time. Although Quarantarily notes that most of the movies in that study were only viewed once and those viewed more almost never evoked perceptions which were contradictory or to conflicting with initial ones, for my studies more than one viewing became necessary. Initially, each movie was watched in full at normal speed. An Excel spreadsheet was used to note using the number one when a convention was found and a comment added as appropriate to explain the observation. Where a convention was not found by the end of the narrative, a zero was entered into the appropriate column. Further viewings were done when checking for additional conventions and other aspects of the study. On top of this, my paper um, today draws upon interviews with people such as Hideo Yokoyama, the author of Climbers High, and also directors of a number of, and producers of a number of uh, different um, dramatizations, and also Sheldon Hall at Sheffield Hallam University, who was a specialist um, in movie studies. All of the interviews were semi-structured and conducted according to the appropriate research ethics. As noted, Yakua suggests that 16 conventions are found in disaster narratives, but it is not clear from his study just how much these conventions apply to all of the narratives he studied. In discussing the conventions, he uses words such as generally, often, rarely, and usually, revealing that in the end, these conditions are seemingly a summary of typical features of disaster narratives, rather than prerequisites for all disaster movies. Although by definition, a convention would suggest that it should appear in each of the narratives, this was only found in one case. Indeed, there were only eight out of his list of 16 conventions that appeared in more than 60% of the narratives studied. Through watching the various English language disaster narratives, I managed to identify some additional conventions that were not part of Yakova's studies. Having tested the conventions found in English language disaster narratives, it was then possible to look at whether these also apply in narratives in Japanese. Japan has a rich pedigree of disaster narratives, with the Godzilla series being probably the most well-known internationally. However, as this study does not include clear-cut science fiction films, it meant that the huge body of Godzilla and similar movies were not included. Similarly, not including animated movies removed another significant part of Japan's movie output. Kirsch notes that after several disaster movies were made in the 1970s, there were not many until a boom in 2006. As with the English language movies, each of the movies selected were viewed several times to check whether they should be included in the study. To check the use of it, usage of existing conventions and to look out for additional conventions not yet identified. In total, 30 movies were studied, of which 22 were ultimately analyzed and remained in the data set. As with the English language movies, these movies included both those that were originally for cinema and those for TV only. One feature that became noticeable with the Japanese narratives was that there are several remakes. In some cases, it was because there is both a TV dramatization and a cinema version, but in another, there were both were cinema versions. As it was found that there were variations in what was shown, both versions were included. Just as with the English language study, it could be argued that Flight 93 and United 93 are both variations of the same original story. As Yakua's study did not include Japanese movies, my study of Japanese disaster narratives considered a longer time span, beginning with Hiroshima, directed by Hideo Sekigawa in 1953, one of the first movies that depicts the horrors and experiences of the Hibakusha, the survivors of the atomic bombing. As a result of the analysis, I found that there are 17 conventions that may appear in disaster narratives, made up of three distinct groups. The first group, Group A is made up of 12 conventions that are found in both at least 60% of English language disaster narratives and also Japanese disaster narratives. The second group, Group B, is made up of three conventions that are found in at least 60% of English language disaster narratives, but less than 60% of Japanese disaster narratives. The third group, Group C, of two conventions 
are those that are found in at least 60% of Japanese disaster narratives, but less than 60% of the English language ones. My analysis begins now with those conventions in Group A, those that were found in at least 60% of both English language and Japanese language disaster movies. As I present this analysis, I will be showing clips from a range of Japanese narratives studied. Throughout narratives, a variety of techniques are used to aid, aid viewers with their suspension of disbelief and to help them think that when it comes to those events based on actual historical events, especially what they are seeing is accurate. However, this accuracy need not be restricted to factual accuracy, but can also relate to more universal aspects of how people behave, for example. This is what Hideo Yokoyama, the author of Kuraima's Hai, calls pillars of truth. Yokoyama argues that with these pillars, people can flip the more unbelievable moments in between and find the whole output believable. These pillars of truth can be seen in all of the dramatizations studied and can be found in the form of characters being knowledgeable on specialist issues, text on screen explaining things, voiceovers, as well as characters providing typical behavior. For example, both versions of Climbers High, there's a TV version and a movie version, use actual television footage from the 1985 JAL crash site around which the story is partly based to make the content seem credible. It is also possible to find the convention of mood of dread and threat in all of the disaster narratives. For example, both versions of Shizumanu Tayo and also Onne no Kanatani show rows of coffins further underlying the traumatic issues that the narratives handle. In Itai Asue no Tokakan, part of the mood of dread or threat comes from the knowledge that movie is based on an actual event, the Great East Japan disaster of March 2011 and what the movie is about, which is clear from the title and imagery on the cover poster. However, this convention applies to disaster narratives. It should be noted that this is the sort of convention that could be expected to be found in many thrillers, for example, and further underlines the fact that there are many crossovers between genre, even if one considers disasters to be a genre of its own. In terms of convention three, that stories primarily impact the nationality of narrative makers, there was only one Japanese disaster narrative that this convention did not apply to, Fukatsu no Hi, which, although it had, a, it had Japanese characters, was focused heavily on the impact of a virus upon Americans and the world. Note that this was made in 1980, a little bit ahead of its time, it turned out. In relation to the fourth convention, that the image of disaster is shown, while well, this applied to all the Japanese narratives made um, in the 20th century, it does not apply to all of the disaster made in the 21st century. The single exception was the previously mentioned Itai Asue no Tokokan, which, although it shows the build up to the earthquake and tsunami, most of the movie is about the period after the tsunami and does not show the earthquake or tsunami striking. Well, when Considering the genre, it is tempted to suggest that the main defining feature of disaster narratives is that they do show the image of disaster. This case shows that this need not be so. Within my study, it's found that there was a dominance of male characters in 92% of the English language narratives studied. However, there were signs that this convention was less prevalent in more recent English language movies. When we look at the Japanese narratives, on the other hand, we see that the opposite is true. This is not to say that there are no female characters, but they are not the main characters. However, in one case, the movie version of Climbers High, a change was made compared to the original novel and NHK version, so that one of the reporters, Tamaki, was female. At one point, the filmmakers had even considered merging the Tamaki and main reporter, Sayama characters, but decided it would be a step too far to have the main reporter being female and the novel's author, Yokoyama, would probably have not allowed it. The change was made in consideration to what a current audience may like to see, rather than being faithful to the novel or what would have been probable in 1985 when the Equal Employment Opportunity Law was only just coming into force. 
In many of the narratives, there are mini victories where a protagonist manages to achieve a particular goal. Examples of these mini victories can be seen with a child being saved from a fire in Nihon Chimbotsu, the saving of some patients in Kansen Reto, and when the dog Roku helps its mother, Hana, to have some medicine in Roku Wanko no Shima. In some narratives, these mini victories may be undone, as is particularly apparent in the dramatizations of Climbers High, whereby the main character, Yuki, has many of his decisions overruled, for example. Another commonly found convention in disaster narratives is for there to be families. In many cases, we find young children seemingly to draw in younger audiences as to cause a stronger reaction among parents in the audience. The most striking example of this relates to the true story of Ken Miyajima, who was a nine-year-old and traveling by himself for the first time when he caught the JAL flight JL-123 in 1985. Although a pseudonym is used, both versions of Shizuman Taiyo feature him and his family. Similarly, Oni no Kanatani uses three families so that the narrative could focus on themes and issues which are pertinent in Japanese society. The next convention, that of the suffering protagonist, was found in all Japanese disaster narratives. This convention is found in many Japanese movies and is based on the tradition of a tragic hero, as Standish calls it, in stories uh, such as Chushan, Chushin Gura, the treasury of loyal retainers about the 47 Ronin, and Abashiri Bangaichi. The key aspect of the suffering protagonist is that despite all the bad things that happen, they keep going and do not quit. Returning to Yuki in Climbers High, we see that his position is undermined or decisions overruled. In the novel and NHK version, despite some outbursts, he continues his work. Only in the movie version, which was intended to have a more international release, do we see a revisionist approach and Yuki resigns from the company. Similar to Yuki, the protagonist in Shizuman Taiyo does not quit his company despite numerous overseas postings. In other cases, the suffering may be related to the death of a spouse, for example, in Mari Tokoinu no Monogatari, or a colleague, for example, in Nigo Ni Seizon Sha'ari. In relation to Convention 9, that a cross-section of society is represented, part of the issue with this convention is how one is to define cross-section of society. If one is to define it literally, so that, for example, at least one disabled person, one LGBTQ person, one ethnic minority, etc., is shown, then it is highly unlikely that any narrative would meet this convention. Rather, my analysis looked at whether the narrative broadly covered its impact on society rather than a relatively select group of people from a particular part of the population, e.g. due to their, their occupation. Despite this, we see that in the Japanese narratives, there is a noticeable underrepresentation of people with disabilities or LGBTQ people, for example. Indeed, the only obvious example of a disabled main character was found in Nigo Ni Saison Sha'ari, which contains a seemingly mute girl, but even she can speak by the end of the movie. Due to both the relative ethnic homogeneity of Japan and a higher degree of income equality than is found in many other developed countries, the likelihood of a cross-section being represented in a Japanese disaster narrative is relatively high. However, in relation to ethnic minorities, while there were 22 foreigners on JL-123, none were shown in any of the five narratives related to this crash, for example. When we consider English language disaster narratives, we find that despite all that happens, there is often, in fact, in 87% of the narratives I studied, optimism and survivors. The climax to many of the narratives is that rather than just a mini victory, there is an ultimate victory, even when all hope at some points seem to have been lost. Two clear examples of this, which you may be familiar with, are Armageddon and Deep Impact, which in both cases, see all life on Earth not being wiped out by asteroids, despite the concerns that they would be extinction level events. When it comes to Japanese disaster narratives, however, we see that this convention appears in fewer narratives. Although it is still relatively high in 79%, for example, in those made in the last 20 years. However, this relatively high percentage masks the fact that many do not end with a positive ending or that the movies will not overly focus on survivors. 
Rather, the focus is on some sort of return to a normality. In relation to this, Okano points out the concept of toijo put forward by Kuromoto. Kuromoto argues that Japanese dramatizations are like a Japanese sweet, toijo, a sugar-coated pill. Personally, I don't think the analogy works as neatly as suggested. Given that most audiences would be aware there are likely to be dark and painful moments in a movie, with some lighter moments and mini victories, means that the movies are perhaps more like being boozled, jelly beans, which if you're not familiar with them, are a pack of jelly beans which consider, contain not only ordinary jelly beans, but also ones that taste things like things like rotten egg, canned dog food, vomit, and so on. Although you know there will be some foul tasting jelly beans if you eat a whole box, you do not know what order the jelly beans will come in, or even if you will finish with a pleasant taste at the end. The combination also means that the ultimate ending of the film may be less important than the story or journey itself. Even so, the underlying concept that many Japanese people are prepared to watch dramas that have a traumatic part and not necessarily happy ending remains valid. Perhaps this acceptance comes from the concepts of wabi-sabi and monono aware that are key within Japanese culture and reflect an acceptance of the transits of things and the inevitability of death. For example. The lack of focus on survivors is most apparent when we consider the narratives relating to the JL-123 crash. Even though four survivors were found at the crash site, the survivors are largely ignored in the narratives and the focus is on those who died and the bereaved families. Similarly, the movie Itai Asue no Tokakan focuses on the identification and treatment of the dead following the 2011 tsunami rather than the survivors. Mari Tokoino no Monogatari stands out as one of the few narratives with a clearly happy ending. Sorry for all the spoilers in here, by the way. One of the last conventions in Group A is that the narrative sees the death of the main character. In terms of narratives where such a death is seen, it includes the death of a prime minister in Nihon Chimbotsu, the 2006 version, Professor Nishi in Kansen Reto, and an old couple taking their own lives in Kibo no Kuni. But no such deaths are seen in either version of Climbers High, The Last Message Umizaru, or Roku Wanko no Shima, for example. In terms of the convention, no distancing in time, it is particularly found in non-historical narratives. However, this convention is applied in more Japanese historical disaster narratives compared to the English language ones, sometimes by using a current timeline, something that is only seen in the case of Cameron's Titanic amongst the English language narratives. Let us now move to the three conventions in Group B, whereby the convention was found in at least 60% of the English ones, but less than 60% of the Japanese ones. The first of these relates to whether there is conflict between characters, but they unite against the disaster. Conflict is found in an increasing number of Japanese disaster narratives, such as Dragon Heddo, both versions of Climbers High, Kibo no Kuni, and Nigo ni Seizon Sha'ari. However, it is not found in either version of Shizu Manu Taiyo, for example, where the conflict between the protagonist and management remains until the end of the film, let alone in dealing with the disaster or disasters, depending how you define disaster in relation to that particular story. Conversely, when it comes to the convention of panic, the percentage of Japanese disaster narratives with this convention has dropped. Within those narratives that do have this convention, we see panic portrayed in different ways. For example, in Nihon Chimbotsu, people run and scream when seeing an approaching tsunami. In Kibo no Kuni, one woman walks around in a hazmat suit due to her excessive fear of possible radiation poisoning following an accident at a local nuclear power station. I wonder where the inspiration for that story came from. And in both versions of Shizu Manutayo, passengers scream aboard the stricken airplane. The person in question to ask here is why panic is not normally shown. In many respects of this, the answer could be that the Japanese narratives are aiming to be more realistic. For as studies by Quarantelli and Mitchell et al. point out, such behavior, and some others shown in, often in um, disaster movies, tends not to be seen in the wake of real disasters. Having said this, how normal it has become to see these days people running in Japan, including news crews, running around like headless chickens as an earthquake strikes, totally going against what they were taught to do at school. 
While English language disaster narratives often have storylines in which a group of people are facing disaster and cannot expect outside help, most of the Japanese disaster narratives show that the disaster affected many people and there could be outside help, including from other countries, as seen in Nihon Shinbotsu. Where isolation does exist, it may be used to help with another convention, such as that of the suffering protagonist, as can be seen with Shizuma Utayo, when the protagonist is on overseas postings, sometimes without his own family. Finally, in this part of the, my talk, let us turn to conventions in Group C, in which conventions were found in less than 60% of English language ones, but at least 60% of the Japanese ones. The first of these relates to showing of dead bodies. That this convention exists for Japanese disaster narratives may stem from early Japanese disaster movies, such as Hiroshima, that have ensured that showing dead bodies was never a taboo. Second, Japan only adopted a rating system for its movies in 1998, ensuring that there has been a long period when filmmakers did not worry about such things, and even now many do not need to worry about such restrictions because cinemas tend to ignore people's age when letting them in to get to watch the film. In terms of contemporary significance, as a country that is often beset by events that may become a disaster, keeping in mind that a disaster is almost always the result of human response to an event or lack of preparedness for such an event, there is a much greater chance for Japanese disaster narratives to have this convention. In some cases, the contemporary significance is not as directly obvious as showing how people respond to an earthquake, for example. Okano points out that the TV station Wow Wow originally planned to make a dramatization to show how people responded and recovered from the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2011. But they considered it too soon in 2012 to do so, and so made a dramatization covering the same themes, but instead focusing on the JL123 crash of 1985. Having set out what the situation is regarding conventions that appear in disaster narratives and some of the reasons as to why certain conventions may or may not be used in Japanese disaster narratives, I will now look in more detail at the issues of conservatism and revisionism in relation to portraying a particular storyline. In that respect, it is most effective to be considering the narratives that surround a single historical event so that fuller comparison can be done. Consequently, I consider the narratives related to the crash of JL123, namely Climbers High, One no Kanatani, and Shizumanu Tayo. That there are two versions of Climbers High and Shizumanu Tayo is particularly beneficial here in looking at the degree to which there is conservatism or revisionism and what the reasons may be for this. Before looking at these issues, let me briefly introduce the three stories. The novel Climbers High, published in 2003, tells the story of one reporter's experiences as his paper attempts to cover the story of JL123. Although the author, Hideo Yokoyama, had been a journalist based at the Gumma newspaper Jomo Shimbun in 1985 and reported on the crash, Yokoyama himself is keen to stress that it is not based directly upon what happened to him in 1985. In 2005, the novel was turned into a two-part dramatization by NHK and a movie followed in 2008. An official English translation of the book called 17 was published in 2018. Both dramatizations were about the same length, but neither covered all the content of the novel. The story has two timelines, one in the present and the other during the week of the JL123 crash. During the narratives, there are conflicts within the company. The protagonist Yuki and his colleagues look to publish a scoop about the cause of the crash, and we find out that writing the truth is important to Yuki. And in the present day timeline, Yuki climbs a mountain. Oni no Kanatani is based on the book Kaze no Sogyo Bohyo by Ryusho Karota. Whilst this is primarily based on interviews with bereaved families, it should be noted that it contains details such as conversations, which are unlikely to be faithful to what was said at the time. Karota was a journalist for a magazine and covered both the JL123 crash, interviewing the bereaved and survivors. In 2012, Wow Wow dramatized sections of the book in two parts using the title Onne no Kanatani, and the book was subsequently reissued with this title. All three versions have the same subtitle of Fathers and Sons of the Jow Crash, although in some cases the mother or wife is either the victim or a key character. 
The story revolves around the crash and the focus is on three families. Shizumanu Taio, written by Toyoko Yamasaki, was published in 2001 after being serialized between 95 and 99. The novel is in three parts and a total of five volumes. The third volume is called the Osutakayama volume and is clearly based around the events surrounding JL123. Shizumanu Taio was made into a movie in 2009 and the satellite channel Wow Wow made a 20 part dramatization in 2016 as part of the channel's 25th anniversary celebrations. In relation to the 2009 movie, the production company Kadokawa Pictures stressed to me that the movie was based on the novel, itself a work of fiction, and so there was no connection between Jail 123 and the film. However, the link between the movie and actual events is clarified by the fact that more could have been done to change the details of the plane, the crash site's location, and where families gathered, for example. Furthermore, one of the DVD's bonus features show that on the final days of filming, which took place on a recreation of the crash site, the cast and crew faced the real crash site and held a minute silence. The DVD also shows that the lead actor, Ken Watanabe, went to Ireno Sono, a memorial dedicated to the JL123 crash, to pay his respects. The 2009 movie boosted one of the biggest budgets for a Japanese film of all time and runs for a total of about three and a half hours, and even includes an interval, which for some reason they left on the DVD as well. Although the literal title is The Sun Which Does Not Set, the official title in English is The Unbroken, but it had a limited international release. The narrative includes scenes in Africa, Karachi, Tehran, and Japan, and features the pro protagonist, Onchi, having a variety of conflicts with the airline, dealing with the plane crash, support being given to the bereaved, and corruption. When, right, right back. There we go. When considering the narratives in relation to conservatism and revisionism, by ex and by extension the degree to which they portray the truth, an obvious starting point is the plane crash itself. In all five, conservatively refer to the crash site as being Osutakoyama, Mount, Os Mount Osutaka. However, this reveals an issue of the accuracy as although the crash site is commonly referred to as being on Osutaka and the crash site is officially Osutaka no One, literally the ridge on Osutaka, the crash site is on another mountain, Mount Takamagahara. The misuse of the crash site name seems to stem from what the site was announced as being by the best-selling newspaper Yomiuri Shimbun and its linked TV station on the 13th of August 1985, after several hours of confusion and 18 different locations being suggested as the correct location. That the dramatizations maintain the conservative position of using Osutakayama underlines the fact that their default position is not to perform a documentary role and the preference is to use the nomenclature with which most viewers would be familiar. Indeed, as Hall says in relation to the movie Zulu, 1964, when judging films, we need to remember that they are not documentaries and they deserve fair consideration on their own terms. Both versions of Shizumanu Tayo and the movie version of Climbers High have a recreation of the crash site. Although there is a degree of accuracy in these, there are also some important differences. First, while in reality, most of the J of JAL was missing from the only large piece of wreckage that remained, the movie version of Climbers High includes the whole of the letter J. In the case of Shizumanu Tayo, the letters are now NAL, as the airline name has been changed to National Airlines and all the letters were visible. Although the 2005 version of Climbers High and Oni no Kanatani do not have recreations of the crash site, they do include actual news footage of the crash site from 1985, as is also done in the other dramatizations. The crash site becomes the focal point of one of the key scenes in both versions of Climbers High, with the NHK version using archive footage as a backdrop. This was done because a recreation of the crash site would have been prohibitively expensive. In terms of the cause of the crash, the novel and 2005 version of Climbers High largely present a version based on the official investigation. However, the 2008 movie version also includes a scene, not in the original novel, where a reporter talks to one of the local search and rescue team and is told that they were following orders 
that they knew where the crash site was and they could have got there earlier and saved more people. The movie finishes with the text, as you can see here, pointing out that while the official report concluded that the plane had probably experienced rapid depressurization following a failure in the rear bulkhead, which had not been properly repaired by Boeing after a previous accident, there are those who question the official report and continue to seek a reinvestigation. The director, Harada, told me that he felt obligated to include this, having discussed the crash with many people and having read books about the crash, which brought the official narrative into question. Both versions of Shizumanu Taiyo, on the other hand, include nothing equivalent to this, which is somewhat surprising given that the novel raises the question of whether the plane was struck by a missile, for example, for which there is some corroborating evidence. With the main story being set in 1985, the dramatizations provide a range of visual clues to help connect with the events of that year. The most notable of these is the heavy usage of Hanshin Tiger's memorabilia in many of the dramatizations. Over half the victims came from the Kansai area where the Hanshin Tigers baseball team is based, and the president of the team was one of those who died in the crash. Following the crash, many people supported the Tigers to win their first ever championship, which remarkably they did, go Tigers, as a way of supporting the team, families and region as it recovered from the crash. However, in terms of overall accuracy, there is an issue with the depiction of one of the victims based upon Ken Miyajima, who I mentioned earlier, who was actually a Kintetsu Buffaloes fan and not a Hanshin Tigers fan, as shown in the 2009 version of Shizumanu Taiyo. Although all five narratives involve the plane crash in some form, they also feature many other locations, and the degree to which these are accurate also impacts the believability of the narrative. Both versions of Shizumanu Taiyo and Onin no Kanatani recreate the scenes in Fujioka where families waited for news and the identification of remains was performed. Looking at photographs of these sites in 1985, there is no doubt that the recreations look authentic, although one should note that most viewers would probably not be aware of this. In the case of Climbers High, perhaps the most noticeable difference between the two versions are the offices of the newspaper company. Whilst some criticized the 2008 version for looking too much like the Daily Planet in the 1978 version of Superman, the director says that it was authentic and the NHK version instead was pandering too much to what people's expectations would be rather than accuracy. Both versions of Climbers High and Onin no Kanatani maintain the real name JAL, Japan Airlines. In the case of NHK, it was the first time a real company's name was used in a television drama and was something that led to a lot of deliberation before being agreed. Shizuman Taiyo, as I noted earlier, like the novel itself, used the name National Airlines instead of JAL, and Prime Minister Nakasone's name was changed to Tonegawa, a river in Nakasone's home prefecture of Gumba, for example. In the case of Shizuman Taiyo, the visual nature of dramatizations meant that one issue had to be addressed, was the logo of the airline. While both versions came out with differing solutions, both managed to provide a hint to the original Jao Tsurumanu logo of a right red circle based upon the Japanese flag with a stylized crane. In the case of the movie, which you can see on the left here, the red circle was largely kept by using a crescent moon inside which there is a single cherry blossom, a potent symbol of Japan. In the 2016 version, the logo is a red circle in which there is a stylized picture of a mountain base probably on Mount Fuji. It should be noted though, the movie version, despite being one of the biggest budget movies um, in Japanese history, they went to all this expense of computer generated images, but when it came to the airplane, as you can probably make out on your screen, they forgot to add the cockpit windows. All five of the JL123 related narratives only focus on a few key, key people. What is interesting in the relative overlap is that we see a certain families in these narratives and elsewhere, such as in documentaries and the media, another form of conservatism. Given that the crash impacted over 400 families, there should be no need to have such restrictions. Perhaps due to the familiarity of certain families, there is a desire for production companies to focus on the same families. It could also be that only these families are prepared to have their story told. In addition to the change of name of company, it, Shizuma Taiyo also changes the names of families. This also happens in the case of Onin no Kanatani. For those wanting to consider the historical authenticity of the dramatizations, the change is noticeable. 
Further, it stands out in the case of Shizuma no Tayo due to the inclusion of Ken Miyajima mentioned earlier and his mother, Kuniko Miyajima, in the story. Mrs. Miyajima became the head of the A12 Ren Rekukai, the association for families of the JL123 crash. Whilst the novel contains the real names of Miyajima and other families after some late pressure from the publisher, um, despite originally um, the novel being written using pseudonyms, Miyajima then agreed for the change to be made, although she has some regrets to the change actually happening. But as I said, the dramatizations have pseudonyms. Only one bereaved family is shown in Climbers High and no name is included. Although the movie version all gives, also gives passing reference to Ken Miyajima and alters the story about Yuki and his son to make an element of the story, as you've just seen, that of Yuki's son traveling by himself on a plane, comparable to Ken's experience of flying by himself for the first time. As mentioned, the story of Ken Miyajima and his family also appears in Shizuma no Tayo, and Mrs. Miyajima is probably the most recognizable and well-known of the bereaved families related to the crash, and is also involved in activities to improve support for families of other disasters, as well as being in the news and documentaries. That her name is not in, used in Shizuma no Tayo is perhaps a little odd in this respect, though many viewers would soon make the link between the character on screen and the real person. Oni no Kanatani also shifts from reusing real names which appeared in the original book. According to the producer, the names of the families were changed even though real names had been in the media as there was concern about any negative impact on their day-to-day -day life. One aspect of the JL123 crash that features heavily in each of the dramatizations are the Isho written by some of the passengers. In total, six notes were written by passengers and one by a crew member, or at least those are the ones which were found. Others may have been written. Climbers High and the movie version of Shizu Manutayo includes the longest and most well-known of the passenger Isho, written by Hirotsugu Kawaguchi. In the case of the movie version of Shizu Manutayo, we even see the Isho being written inside the plane, as well as being discovered by the sun and read out again at a later point, with the names changed, of course. In Oni no Kanatani, the focus is on the Uesugi family, allows for inclusion of Masakazu Taniguchi's Isho, again, because of the name being changed. As discussed elsewhere, the Isho are one of the factors for which the crash is best known, so it would be surprising for one of them not to have been included. The Isho is an aspect I continue to do research about, and I'm currently conducting an online survey related, related to this, so if you would like to help with that, please go via my website later and um, find the link to the, to the survey. In conclusion, I have noted how the studying of disaster narratives is complicated by the fact there is no recognized disaster genre, an issue which partly stems from the lack of clarity about what constitutes a disaster. Disaster narratives tend to be an amalgam of other genre, yet despite this, I have revealed how there are certain conventions which are regularly used in disaster narratives. However, I have noticed and noted that there are differences between English language and Japanese language ones in relation to the conventions that are used. The study found that there are three groups of conventions, those which appear in both types, those which only appear on the whole in the English, and ones which generally only appear in the Japanese. My study also noted there are some significant changes or revisionism that if they continue may mean that a reclassification of conventions and the groups in which they appear may become necessary. Furthermore, this study considered conservatism and revisionism in relation to the handling of an actual historical event, the JAL Flight JL123, by five narratives. It is found that there were elements where there is a tendency for the narratives to maintain a conservative approach, that is to use terms or facts that the majority of the public would be familiar with, for example. However, it was also found that there were elements of revisionism whereby changes were made to storylines when compared to other versions or actual events. The reasons for such changes appear to stem from the need of movie making companies to consider their potential market and elements such as directors' desire to cover particular details. If anybody would like to know the sources that I used and so on, please uh, contact me uh, afterwards. I can uh, answer individual requests. Uh, but thank you very much for listening. And I will now stop sharing my screen and hand back over to Heidi. Chris, thank you very much indeed. That was um, a 
real whirlwind and uh, fantastic presentation. I had not known so any so much detail about uh, the different uh, movies and and the comparison of the the different JAL uh, JL um, one two three narratives was particularly interesting. You mentioned that the there was revisionism in some of the later narratives and I, and and some of the reasons behind it. Were they too close in time to be caused by changes in public behaviours or expectations um, of how people ought to behave? Um, you know, as you know, if you look at Western movies, you know, the, the treatment of um, the, 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 the frontier West changes over time, depending on what's going on in the United States. But are these two, two, is the time period too, too close to see similar tendencies in, in these disaster movies? I don't think so. I mean, um, obviously, if we look specifically at the JAL crash ones, um, the first dramatization is done in 2005, mm -hmm. which is 20 years on from the crash. So there's quite a, a gap there. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is interesting is that there's only a three year gap between the NHK version and the movie version. And yet we see differences happen, which, as I said, I think is down to partly the fact it was a movie rather than TV, they got a bigger budget, but also the director's own interest in this. Um, and then there are, obviously it's then another, um, a year until the first version of Shizu Manutayo comes out, a couple of years until Oni no Kanatani, and then a couple more years until the TV version. So there are gaps there. Having said that, we're still very early on in the overall scheme of things in relation to dramatizations, uh, I believe. Um, I mean, if we make a comparison, which I often do between the JL123 crash and um, the sinking of Titanic, although movies were coming out about the Titanic um, very early on, and keep in mind, the cinema world was very much in its infancy. I mean, the sinking happened in... Um, Hello. Just as movies were happening and so on. Um, um, it wasn't really until um, A Night to Remember in 1958, 59, that Titanic movies really became something that the mass public wanted to watch. And that movie really seems to have been the catalyst for the, the story of the Titanic becoming fixed in the, um, the public sort of social sphere, people knowing about the story and having a version of what they think happened. So, I mean, that's 40 something years on from the sinking. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. Yeah, we're not there yet with JAL and I think one of the things which we may see potentially change in the future um, is that, as I said, so far, none of the dramatizations have really talked about the survivors. Um, maybe that could change. But equally, as I said in my paper, there doesn't seem to be much interest in survivors in Japanese narratives. So maybe that will be one aspect that isn't talked about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Uh very interesting. There's questions are flooding in and I'll, some people have raised their hands and there are some people who are in the chat who I'll ask if they would like to um, give their questions verbally. But I will. Um, Martin was Martin Barrow is quite early. Martin, I'm just going to um, unmute you if you'd like to ask your question and then I'll come to Roger and Makoto and then come to some of the ones in the chat. Hi, Chris. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Martin. Thank you for joining today. Thank you for that over, overall insight. Um, on a slightly wider point, I'd be interested in your views on the way disasters of whatever sort are described and what is the sort of core message about them. And um, 2011 is a good example where it's called, you know, Hingashi Nihon uh, Dai Shinsai, and it's translated as Great East Japan Earthquake. I mean, calling it great is odd. And of course, East Japan, of course, to, I'm not trying to play down the tragedy um, for the people of the east side of Tohoku, but, you know, it was 90% 90, 90 of Tohoku was not affected. So it's said, you know, great East Japan earthquake is a misleading description in my view. And uh, I'd be interested in your views on that. Yep, thank you very much. I know a very uh, personal and I think important um, question. Um, I, most Japanese earthquakes um, will be given a name of some sort. It's very rare for them to be 
effectively upgraded to use the suffix Shinsai rather than just Jishin. Jishin is your standard earthquake. Shinsai um, has the idea that it's much larger. Um, and there are always problems with terminologies. And over time, sometimes the terminology changes. So the 1995 earthquake, which I, I think around the world is widely referred to as the Kobe earthquake, has had a variety of different titles in Japanese, either referring to it as the Hanshin earthquake or the Awaji um, Hyogo prefecture earthquake and so on. There have been changes. None of them are ideal, partly because I mean, as your question indicates, the impact of these things often reaches far beyond the immediate impact. And in fact, one of the things that people are looking at more and more now um, is how people can suffer from, for example, the 2011 earthquake and uh, tsunami disaster as a whole, not from having experienced it directly, but from watching the images live on TV, particularly this type of PTSD is more if they have some connection to the place. Um, so there's, there's always an inherent problem with names. And I think, I mean, I literally did a blog post about this yesterday. I think there is also a problem with the way that society and the media responds to disasters and events that let's not beat around the bush. The media, and I'm afraid sometimes the public as well, enjoys a disaster. It's People will tune in to watch it. The newspapers will churn out newspaper inch after newspaper inch. Um, and they expect a human reaction from this and pouring out of emotion in a way that many other people, their lives and their deaths are completely ignored. And there's a mismatch. And this is one of the stories that, and themes of Climbers High. So yes, I totally agree with your point that um, the titles are misleading. But I think there's also a problem that you could never get a perfect title, but uh, the 2011 one is particularly problematic because it uh, it doesn't really encapsulate in the Japanese language quite the breadth of the nature of the disaster. Thank you, Chris. Um, Roger, you have a question. Good morning, Christopher. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was I'm pretty much overwhelmed by your breadth and depth of disaster. Um, I was wondering, could, could you possibly put up that list of conventions again? Because I I, yeah, I, I, try. I found it difficult to remember them while you were talking sure, about Let me else. see if I can get it up. Um, there we go. Is that showing for you? Right. Thank you. Um, yes. I'm, um, um, well, one overall question, um, if I might. Um, about, about the, con the conception of convention. I mean, if you look at convention in the dictionary, it says it's a, you know, a socially agreed norm of behavior. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent, you know, is, there, is everything a, 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 a norm of behavior or are there physical constraints? Well, you know, to give silly examples, I mean, if you're designing an airplane, uh, you you know you don't put wings on because it's well we, I suppose we ought to because the passengers wouldn't feel very nice without them you know it's a physical constraint of you know, you know if you want if you want um, a plane to fly it needs to have wings it's uh, if you if you're designing a car it's not just a convention that the driver's seat, seat faces forward it's it's also a con physical constraint um, and so to what extent have you critiqued these these lists as being definitely um, conventions that are adopted by filmmakers as opposed to constraints that it wouldn't be a disaster if you didn't have them. Um, I'll stop sharing so I can answer. Hopefully you can still see it to some degree behind me anyway. Um, I've addressed it to some degree. I take on board the point that sometimes things have to be done. Um, although it doesn't always apply. I mean, the airplane one is of course is a very good example because planes so far do need to have wings, but I'm sure most of us are, have traveled at some point on the Shinkansen, um, and you will note that has lights on the front of the Shinkansen. The lights were actually only put there because the designer of the train thought the passengers would not get on a train which doesn't have lights. They serve no purpose whatsoever because the lights can't shine the distance that the train, sort of the, the braking distance of the train. They, they are useless. They, they are a confidence trip for passengers. Um, 
there are certain constraints. Budget tends to be the biggest constraint, but primarily um, I was building upon the work by Yakoa where really there do seem to be certain conventions and expectations that come from an amalgam. I don't think it's one or the other, just as I would argue that all disasters are a combination of factors rather than just one single smoking gun. Uh, these conventions, quite often there are pressures coming from more than one direction. Um, and so I think there are expectations on both sides. And I think in reality, um, as I said during the presentation, many of these conventions in reality, you would find in many other types of thriller, action movie and so on. I don't think they're particularly unique in that respect. A lot of these things are quite commonplace. I think those that fall into categories B and C, where there's a difference between the English language ones and the Japanese language ones are perhaps of more interest. Um, this table, by the way, you can find it either in an article which I've written, again, there's a link via my blog page, or I've written a separate blog where I just listed it as well. So you'll be able to find it on the website too. Um, so there do seem to be some differences, which may come down to where you've got a home domestic market and an international market or different perceptions about what's needed. So there do seem to be differences there, but uh, yeah, where the influence is coming from, some which ones of these are pragmatic um, restraints and so on. I think actually it would be very difficult sometimes to always draw the line, but thank you for thank the question. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Makoto Takashi, you've got a question, I think. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, presentation, Chris. Um, as my background maybe indicates, I, I'm probably unfairly uh, personally disappointed that animation uh, gets excluded in this definition. Um, but I, I did actually want to ask a question about uh, the boundary drawing and how that affects the cultural comparison, particularly because uh, anim both animation and sci-fi might occupy uh, different places within the kind of media landscape of English and Japanese language cinema. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, you mentioned that with it by excluding sci fi, you exclude Godzilla. Um, by excluding animation, you, for example, end up excluding the most uh, recent adaptation of Japan Sings. Um, and I was thinking particularly about how this affects like the most prominent ex examples of the genre. Um, you know, you briefly mentioned that Titanic is still the highest grossing English language disaster movie. But when I was thinking about, you know, the uh, most critically acclaimed, but also I think the highest grossing um, disaster movies broadly defined of the last 10 years in Japan. I mean, it's probably Shin Godzilla and um, Kimi no Nawa. Um, and so what does this mean for the kind of broader claims about how media representations affect, um, for example, disaster preparedness? Might it just reflect that certain themes, particularly in the kind of Japanese media ecology, are dealt with in other formats rather than a kind of more traditional live action um, movie format? Thank you for the question. Um, this was one of the most troubling aspects I've had with this research. I mean, I've been working on this for three years or so, and you can imagine some of it just took a long time because of having to watch each thing at least once, particularly in the case of a 20 episode version of Shizumen no Tayo, where each episode runs to 45 minutes and having to watch that at least once. Um, a lot of the boundary lines came from, as we all do as academics, you go to see what other people have written first and think about, did they get it right or wrong? What do I want to change? Um, it was actually very tricky. I mean, I was very happy to throw out satire type ones because I didn't think it was going to be relevant um, because part of what I was looking at was, I mean, in relation to things like panic, for example, I don't think I could be looking for that convention if you got satire because things are likely to be over the top, for example. Um, I was so pleased to get rid of that one because I started watching one film which is meant to be a satire based on all other disaster movies. And I think it's got one of the lowest ratings on IMDb of all movies. In the end, I was pleased to stop watching it after 12 minutes, it was so atrocious. And I gradually started tweaking what things I would or wouldn't, wouldn't include. Some people have included science fiction before, some haven't. Some have included war, some haven't. Um, I don't include war where it's focused on the war itself, but where it's focused more on the impact on society. So, which is why I end up with two films about Hiroshima, they're in there. 
science fiction is actually the hardest single one to do because I don't know what science fiction is. And the analogy I always um, give here is, if you'd said to somebody in early 1945, it's possible to split an atom and it will create a big bomb, they'd say that's science fiction. Of course, the events later that year proved that splitting an atom wasn't science fiction. And I had a few where I was right on the boundary, should I allow it, shouldn't it? Um, the one which is the dodgiest of the lot was the core, which involves basically like a spaceship going through to the core of the Earth. Um, to me, it makes no sense. But the possibility of somebody designing something like that at some point, I can't deny that's a possibility in the way that splitting the atom is possible. So using aliens and large creatures became the sort of a, a way of separating out. Because again, I thought the reaction in relation to some things like panic and so on would become problematic when you got certain things. And I did this before starting my studies on the English language movies. And again, I was able to then eliminate some um, because of this. And it was only after finishing the English language movies, and I thought, right, now I've got the new convention sorted out, which didn't include all of these. It sort of included Yakova's list and it's like sort of a few little possibility new ones. I started moving on to the Japanese ones. And as soon as I did the, started working on the Japanese ones, it's just like, I've taken out Godzilla. What have I done? Um, and I spent a few days stopping and thinking about it. Should I go back to the English language ones? Should I do something to allow Godzilla back in? And in the end, I said, I thought, no, I've got more than enough for this study. This can be for somebody else or me to do at a later stage. I'm not actually a massive Godzilla fan myself, um, but something for somebody to do at a later stage and see whether these conventions apply. And I, I would use the same argument for the animation. Um, again, partly because I'm not a particular fan of anime and manga anyway, so I was quite happy not to have to look at those. Plus, I thought I was going to end up with a massive imbalance. Um, I could only think... I mean, because there's no disaster genre on IMDb, I had to do all my own hunting to figure out what would be a movie I could study. And when I was still potentially looking at disaster movies, the only animation one which I thought would fit um, neatly, I think the title is Where the Wind Blows, which is an animation about an old couple facing nuclear war in the UK. And I thought, I've got one here. The Japanese, potentially, the list is going to dwarf the live action ones. Let's leave animation out. Again, because there's certain things you can do in animation which you can't do in live action, even with computer generated graphics. So I thought, let's leave it out for now, but open up an opportunity for someone to revisit it. But as you said, soon after an article which I wrote on this got published, Netflix released the series um, Nihon Chimbotsu. So there's now three versions, uh, dramatized versions of Nihon Chimbotsu. And I did watch that. And now whenever I watch a disaster narrative of any sort, whether it's animation or anything, I can't help but mentally start ticking off the conventions in my head and so on. Um, I'm still happy that I didn't do animation in the original study, but I would certainly welcome others to do it. It may not be something I would do, although for some bizarre reason I've started quite enjoying watching some animation really recently. So who knows, I may do it myself. Thank you. Great question, Makoto. It's something for you to pick up um, later on. Um, I've asked Ian, in Rack Raxton, you have a question in the chat. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's quite short, um, perhaps not easy to answer. I don't know. What do you think is the most likely cause of the crash in the jail, the jail crash? Uh, or is it still much too much of a mystery to say? I can say what I think it is, and I haven't changed my mind since I published the book nearly 10 years ago, is that in my view, I think the faulty repair in 1978 is part of the reason, but I don't go along with the idea that it was rapid depressurization. The theory is that this, the rear bulkhead broke open, lots of air went rushing out, this blew off the tail and also broke the hydraulics. There's plenty of evidence to suggest this doesn't quite work. Um, I, I I do believe there was missiles in the area, but I don't actually think the missile was responsible for the um, for the plane crashing. I think more likely is that in the rear part of the plane, there's something called a pressure relief door, where if there's too much high pressure in there, behind the bulkhead, it's meant to drop open and the air goes out. Um, 
My feeling is that this pressure relief door did not open as it's supposed to. And so gradually, so rather than a rush, gradually pressurized air was seeping into the rear part of the plane. And then this led to the tail blowing off and the hydraulics being broken. Everything else plays out exactly the same way as is done in the official report. If you just say that the pressure relief door did not open. Um, why this was never looked at, it's questionable and maybe is not something for me to be discussing in too much detail in this presentation, maybe for another presentation or a discussion at another time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. We've got quite a lot of questions in the chat, but we're running out of time and we've taken a lot of your time um, so far, uh, Chris, but we'll carry on for a bit longer, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, if, if, other pe if people don't get that question answered, they are welcome to email me and so on. Let me uh, just move the slideshow back onto the other screen. You should be able to see my email address and everything. OK, fantastic. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to unmute uh, Peter Matanli Peter to unmute. He has a couple of questions. And thanks for your um, comment about the naming of earthquakes, Peter. It was good to see that. Um, but you have a question, I think. Oh, yeah, thank you, Heidi. Uh, and thank you, Chris, as well. And I think this is the second time I've seen this pres or version of this presentation. And it it's, uh, looks like it's developing really nicely. I mean, one thing I'm really immensely impressed by is the actual number of hours that you've dedicated to this enormous task. Um, and, and it's actually, I think, for the non-academics amongst us, it's probably a good, a good window into actually how much time it takes to do this kind of research. So, I mean, for that reason, and that reason aside, I mean, I I'm also embarked at the moment on a study of my own, not on disasters, but it it's in film studies which is requiring a huge amount of time. And um, one thing I'd like to ask is a little bit more detail about your methodology, because one thing that I'm finding difficulty with, and I think might be quite illuminating, is um, when you watch a film, how long does it actually take you to watch it? Um, and, and you know, how often do you press the pause button and write things down? And, and what kind of detail are you putting into these notes? And, sure. and, um, and, and are you using other tools beyond Excel, such as NVivo and so on, to kind of um, regularize or systematize your, your methodologies? Um, just, just some detail on that. Maybe actually we should just talk a, a, another time, just the two of us about this, but yeah. I think it's kind of informative for others too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, a short response, which hopefully everybody will be relatively interested in, and then we can detail, do a more detailed chat another time. I'd never actually really stopped to do this. Think about this at one point in terms of the first question, how long did you spend on this? Um, because I knew what needed to be done, so I just got on and did it. And it was only when um, one of the um, anonymous referees came back to uh, the, an article I was writing on this, came back and said, you really should comment a little bit more about how much time you spent on it, that I sat down and started doing the maths on it. Um, and although I never kept a track of it, based on what I can say to some of the answer of your second question, I estimated it's just the viewing alone, not even the writing or doing any additional reading, literature reviews, anything like that, just the viewing alone came out at 500 hours. Um, Keep in mind that a university says that we should be working 1500 hours a year. I'd spent apparently 500 of those hours watching these things, which to some of you, you may think that sounds like a lot of fun, but it's, it's not just sitting back with popcorn and so on. You're looking out for symbolisms and all sorts of things. You can't look away for a second in my case, because you're looking for particular conventions. Um, as I said, initially I tend to, because I was working with existing list conventions, I would go through just at normal speed almost like a tick box exercise, is this convention there or not? And I kept it simple on Excel because I didn't want to have to do too much more than that, um, because I wanted to be keeping my eyes on the screen as much as possible, looking out for anything else. I mean, one of the things that became, without lowering the tone too much, given we're still quite early in the day in Britain, alone, but without lowering the tone too much, it became quite obvious early on that many English language disaster movies, there are, there are female characters, but they tend to be there to show rather a lot of cleavage, let's say. And for a long time, I actually thought this was going to end up being a convention. But in the end, it, it, when I went back through all the movies, fast forwarding to check things like this, um, it, it fell through below the threshold. 
Um, but quite often I would be watching the movies the second time through on fast, faster speed. After a while, you get to know the movies quite well, so you know where particular scenes are, so you can jump around. So there is a certain speeding up process. But I then had to go back through all the English language ones again after I looked at the Japanese ones when I started finding potential new conventions because I had to look, is this in there? And there's a whole load of things I was looking at. Are there things like the national flag being used heavily? Things like this. And you can't skip around for that. You've got to be going through the whole thing again, sometimes at 1.2 speed, but you can't go too quickly because you might miss it. But we can handle the more detailed questions and so on, uh, maybe by email. But fundamentally, Excel did the trick for me. Although the biggest problem I have with Excel is because I have a problem with my eyes, where all of you probably see Excel as a lovely grid pattern, I actually see wavy lines everywhere. I don't see straight lines. So Excel is problematic at times with that. But I know that I got everything in the right box, at least. The lines aren't that bad for me. Unexpected challenges. Um, there's a couple. Um, I don't know whether Stella is still there, but I was trying to unmute you just now, Stella. But um, let's skip now to Stephen McNally, who I think has a question. No, Heidi, I, I think this is probably something I can, you know, maybe mention and bring up with Chris separately, because it doesn't really, you know, in a sense, it isn't to do with film as such and how disaster is treated in films, but just a general question of, you know, how it all does actually factor into different approaches to risk management, which is, you know, a problem that we that we have at the moment with the current pandemic. But, you know, it's something a little bit off off the theme so you know let let please it's go a little on. bit off but I, I mean i just quickly say that i mean one of the previous studies i looked at was looking at this whether there's a mismatch or not between what's shown in films and people's behavior yeah and there is a mismatch but equally there was some suggestion that movies are starting to and this this study was done back in 1985 was starting to influence the way people behave and although i made it a somewhat flippant comment earlier on um I do find it very disappointing when they show the, like there was the earthquake recently in Sendai, I think it was, um, and they show the images from the NHK office of the, earth, the earthquake happening and all the staff running around and doing things. And it's just like, since you were six years old, you went to elementary school, 1st of September every year, you were taught earthquake, get under desk. What are you doing? Yeah. Why are you like this in NHK, why are you showing this to people? Because it's encouraging people to do the same thing. Sort yeah. it out. Okay, well, that's fairly direct. Thank you, Chris. And uh, very valid, especially, you know, when we're thinking, as, as, as Stephen said, about disasters generally. Stella, I know your um, question is quite relevant to Chris and his research. So would you like to um, give it? Yes. Hello. Thank you for the lecture. It was really fascinating. I'm currently doing my master thesis in France about uh, how um, uh, post uh, 311 reconstruction is uh, shown in uh, Japanese movies, and uh, I was wondering what were your thoughts about uh, the phenomenon of disaster tourism uh, taught by Dennis Lim about the wave of Japanese movie directors going to the, the, the areas touched by the disaster and uh, this fascination that's going on. What do you think about, about this phenomenon? Yeah, thank you. Very interesting question. It's another one of my aspects of research. From start, start, the starting point of a single event, the jail crash, there are so many different directions that you can go off on and I have gone off on. And so one of the things I look at is memorialization and also dark tourism, uh, where people go to events associated with tragedies. I have a problem with it when it comes to some of these large events, um, because I don't know where we draw the line, because I don't know whether the average person themselves knows why they visit a place. So if someone goes to the jail crash site, for example, are they going there because they have an interest in the crash? Are they going there because they are reminiscing about what they were doing when the crash happened, if they're of a certain age? Are they going because they've seen one of these dramatizations I've been talking about and want to connect with it in that way? Where do we draw the line? 
And I think in many cases, if you ask people, they will come up with a rational answer. I know this is a discussion I've had with Peter Matanley before about things. People like to come up with a rational answer for what actually could well be a completely irrational reason, but they don't want to tell you that side. They almost want you to hear the answer that they think you want to hear rather than actually explaining what they were, what the real motivations were, which, as I said, they may not know. So although I use terms like dark tourism and so on, mm -hmm. I actually don't like them because I think the dividing line is impossible to tell sometimes. Um, I think when it comes to events like 311 and the 2011 earthquake tsunami, which you mentioned, obviously we are likely to see more and more dramatizations and movies in some form related to this. And I can see we got um, Akiko Nagata on the on the in the seminar today um, she's been working on this area looking not sometimes where they deal directly with the events but deal sometimes with issues in the same way that on in or Kanatanis, it, it deals with issues rather than actual events directly sometimes um, i think we're likely to see more of these in relation to the 2011 earthquake and tsunami but whether this would be the motivation for people to go to places i think is sometimes hard to tell unless they go to somewhere, it's filmed a little bit out of the way. I mean, if, say for example, one of the crash sites, which was made to do the recreation in Shizumano Tayo, if that recreation site still existed and people visited that rather than the real place, then clearly that's a form of content tourism. Um, but if people are going to see the, the lone pine tree, which obviously in the end didn't survive and they've made a sculpture of it instead, mm -hmm. Is that gonna, can we really tell whether people are doing that because of the event itself, because they saw it in a movie or a documentary? I think the distinction doesn't really matter. I think what we need to think about more is the impact it has on the local community, both positive and negative, because there are plenty of people who would actually just rather move on now. Um, and this is another aspect I've looked at in terms of memorialization and how memorials change over time as the bereavement, their own uh, personal journey through bereavement changes. Right, thank I you. If I didn't answer it fully, please send me an email. No, it's all right. Thank you. Just to conclude, um, just one final question from Isabel is, do you think there will be a genre of films devoted to disasters in future? It will, it will be genreized, as it were. I would like to say yes. That's a great question. I never actually thought about it. Um, let me say yes, and let me say I hope IMDb gives a credit to me for doing it. There we go. How about that for a finish? <laughs> thank you very much indeed. That's great. So from all of us, thank you so much, Chris. Um...